Okay, guys. So, my name is Lise. Um, I'm the education manager here at the Center for Sensory and Motor Neural Engineering. And I'm also a postdoctoral researcher part time. I work in the Department of Neurosurgery. So, I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about what we do at the center, what about or what neural engineering is, and what sensory motor means. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about what my research is specifically. And then, what we're going to do is um, we're going to have two demonstrations. Um, so we'll have an EEG demo and we'll have an EMG demo. I'll tell you what that means. Okay? If you guys have questions, you can raise your hand at any time. Okay, so what is neural engineering? It's basically using an engineering technique and applying it to something in the nervous system. So that's pretty easy. We would do that for people that have a neural injury, like they have a spinal cord injury or a stroke, or they have a neural disease, like um, Lou Gehrig's disease or ALS. Um, so we would want to help people, um, we would want to repair damaged nervous systems, but we may also want to augment or increase the function of an already functioning nervous system. We might also want to figure out more about how nervous systems work, so we could maybe apply engineering principles to that. Um, and uh, we might also want to develop machines that are based on how the nervous system works to help us do things like um, maybe a remote rescue, right? What does sensory motor do? It's really simple. It just means it has to do with both sensory systems and motor systems. So those two things are really closely related in the nervous system, and that's why we have just one word for both things. And what are brain-computer interfaces? That's just a direct communication with an outside machine and with the brain, or actually some other part of the nervous system. So your nervous system is your central nervous system, which is your brain and your spinal cord, and your peripheral nervous system, which are all the nerves that come out of your spinal cord and go out to your muscles and the other parts of your body. Does that make sense? Okay, this is a 3D computer rendering of the surface of somebody's brain. Um, you might notice that this is just the top part, so the brain stem and the cerebellum are missing. It's not because they were missing from the brain, they're just missing from the picture. This was made from a series of MRI images, magnetic, magnetic resonance imaging. You guys know the big magnetic bore? Does anybody have an MRI? Yeah? Um, so they, they use big magnets, basically, to take pictures of what your brain looks like. Um, this is the brain of a graduate student that works in the lab that I work in. So this is a theoretically healthy, normal brain. Um, brains are made up of neurons. This is a drawing of a neuron. So a neuron is a kind of cell that's only located in your nervous system. So only in your brain, your spinal cord, or your peripheral nerves. Um, this is the basic structure of the neuron. So this is the cell body here. These sort of trees on the outside, these are called the dendrites. And this is where all of the inputs come into the cells. This long part down here, this is the axon, and this is where the output from the cell goes out. So what's really important about neurons is that they communicate with each other. That's sort of the special property of neurons. And they do that using electricity, which is really good as engineers because we know something about electricity, right? We can record electrical signals, and we can actually produce electrical signals. So we can listen to what the neurons are saying to each other, and we can maybe even get in on that conversation and say something back to the nervous system. So that's just a drawing of a neuron. This is a picture of an actual neuron. This is actually a hippocampal pyramidal cell, if you're interested. This is the cell body here. These are the dendrites out here. And then this is the axon. So how do we build a brain-computer interface? Because that's one of the things that we're really interested here at the center. So there are two different kinds, fundamentally. You can have a motor BCI or you can have a sensory BCI. So with a motor BCI, what you want to do is you want to measure all the electro electrical activity that's happening in the brain, and specifically the electrical activity that corresponds to motor function. So what's motor function? Does anybody know what I mean by that? Does anyone want to guess? So motor function is what moves you around in the environment. So it's the ability to move your arms and your legs and your head and all of the muscles in your body. So what we want to do is we want to record the part of the brain that corresponds to that movement. And then we want to decode that signal. So just because we can record those electrical signals doesn't mean that we know what they mean right away, right? They don't come out in English or Spanish or Chinese. Uh, we have to use engineering principles to decode what those electrical signals mean. And once we've done that, we want to use that signal to control an external device. What kind of an external device? Anybody have an idea? Yeah. 
a robot would be a great example. What else? Yeah. A machine. A machine, right? So those are both great examples of how we might take signals from the brain and turn them into a movement of some other device, so a robot or some kind of machine. Okay, a sensory device goes exactly the opposite way. So instead of taking signals out of the brain and turning them into something that happens in the physical world, what we want to do is take signals from the physical world and turn them into something that the brain understands. So a physical signal that we might want to put back into the brain would be something like light or um, temperature, or a sense of texture or touch, those would all be sort of physical things, like pressure that we can put back into the brain. So we need to encode whatever that physical signal is that we measure that has to turn into an electrical pattern that the brain can understand. And then we have to deliver that electrical pattern straight to the brain. So I want to show you guys just a couple examples of what those might be like. So I'll start with some sensory devices. The one that I'm showing you right here is a cochlear implant. And you can see there's an outside part and an inside part. This is the outside part right there. Um, there's an inside part that goes in, actually, and it hits on the auditory nerve of this little girl. So she is somebody that had profound hearing loss. They give her this implant, and with this implant now she can hear. That's the purpose of the cochlear implant. And cochlear implants are actually the most popular, the most used, the most commercially viable of all brain-computer interfaces today. So you might see people wearing these. They're, they're fairly common. This is something um, sort of similar, but a little bit different. This is a retinal implant. So what you're looking at here is a picture of the back of somebody's eye. If you go to the ophthalmologist or the optometrist, and they dilate your eyes, you know, and your pupils get really, really big, and they look in, this is the part of your eye that they're looking at, is the retina. This is somebody that has um, the photoreceptor cells that allow someone to see. Um, in this person, the photoreceptor cells have degenerated, which means they've died, they're gone and they can no longer see it. But they've implanted this grid of electrodes on the back of the eye, and then they stimulate electrically those um, points on the back of the eye, and that person gets the perception of vision. This is something that's just a little bit different, but I like to throw it in just to sort of broaden what we're talking about when we talk about a sensory VCI. This is also for somebody who would be blind, but instead of stimulating the retina, they're actually stimulating the tactile system. So this is a tactile visual sensory substitution device. Tactile system is what? Does anybody know? It's your sense of touch. Okay? So when I say tactile, it just means the things that you feel in, um, in your skin. Okay? Um, so what they're doing is they actually have a camera <coughs> and they record the visual environment, what you would see with your eyes, and then they turn that into stimulation that they're providing actually on the tongue. So you can see she has something sort of sticking out of her mouth. That's because she has an electrode array on her tongue. Why would they put it on the tongue? That seems like a weird place to put it, doesn't it? Yeah. Close. So you do have taste buds on your tongue, but you also have a lot of, um, of tactile sensory receptors on your tongue. So you can feel things really, really well when they're, when they're in your mouth. That means you have a lot of sensory acuity on your tongue. That's the word that we use. You have a lot of resolution. So you have a lot of different points that you can see with in your mouth as opposed to on other parts of your body. Like on your arm, very poor sensory acuity. Okay. Now I want to talk about some motor devices. This one is called a functional electrical stimulation or an FES device. This is for people that have spinal cord injury right about here on their neck. That means they can still control their head and their shoulder and their neck, but they're paralyzed from here down. So they're functionally quadriplegic. Okay? So what they do is they take electrodes and they embed them into the muscles. Um, the muscles in the arm and in the shoulder and in the back. And what happens when you stimulate the peripheral nerves that go out to the muscles electrically, it causes the muscle to contract because your muscles are electrically active. Okay? So if you do that stimulation in the right order, you can actually get functional movements out of that. So what they've done is they've enabled people to extend their arm, to flex their arm, and then they give them a couple of different grip options. And that enables people who were completely um, unable to use their arms now to feed themselves, or to shave, or to brush their hair, or to brush their teeth. Which maybe doesn't seem like a lot to you, but if you can't do any of those things, that's a pretty big deal. So I said 
that people um, that they give these to people that have a break right around here in the spinal cord and they can still move their shoulders. Do you guys know why that might be? Does anyone want to guess? Today. <laughs> what? I think they're being shy today. Okay. They, they usually talk a lot more. <laughs> well, I'll give you a hint. What? How do you? How do you think you control this device? How do you think you tell your arm you want it to contract? Yeah. Good brain. Well, that would be one way to do it, but there's no brain part of this implant, right? It's all muscle. So how do you think these people are controlling that device? Yeah. With their, with their what? With their nerve. Nope. Not with their nerve. Simpler than that. Yeah. Muscle? Well, with their muscles, right? So they're moving their shoulders. Okay? They put a switch on the wheelchair and they want to be able to hit that switch. Well, if you can't move your shoulders, you can't use the device. Okay? This is one of the big problems that we have to think about in brain computer interfaces is what's the control signal that you still can use when you want to control the device? So somebody said you could use your brain. Well, that's a really good idea. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about. Okay, this is a different kind of a device. This is for somebody that has an amputation. You can see this woman has had her arm amputated right about the shoulder. And they've given her this really complicated robotic prosthetic, right? Well, how does she control this really complicated robotic prosthetic? Yeah? Not, not quite, but close. We had the, we had the answer earlier. The nerves, so they're recording the activity of the nerves that actually stimulate this muscle right here. This muscle in the chest is the pectoralis muscle, okay? Um, and it's usually meant to help you do things like push-ups, right? But they, what they've done here is they're, they're repurposing that muscle. So they're recording the muscle activity, just like we're going to do later, um, the electrical activity of the muscle, and they're using that as a control signal for this arm. So now when she contracts her pectoralis muscle, it moves, instead of moving her chest, it moves this robotic arm. And she's actually very lucky because she had, um, after her amputation, she had a little um, nerve stump left. So what was left after the amputation of the nerve that used to go out to her arm. And they were actually able to take that part of the nerve and wire it back into the pectoralis muscle as well. So now they put sensor, um, like pressure sensors, on the tips of her artificial hand. And when things touch that artificial hand, she can feel it right here. So she can, she has both sensation and she has the ability to move that arm in her Okay. Well, here's somebody that has a very, very high level spinal cord injury. Okay. His neck is broken right here at the very base of his skull. He's actually stabbed in a bar fight and it completely severed his spinal cord. Okay. You can see he can't even breathe on his own. That's why he has a respirator. So he can't move even his shoulders, he can't move any part of his body, except for his facial muscles. Um, what they've done here is that you see this thing that looks like a plug in his brain, that actually is a plug in his brain, okay? There are electrodes that are going down into his brain, into the part of his brain that controlled movement, or did control movement before he was paralyzed. And they record the activity, the, the communication of those neurons in the brain, and they use that to control something else. In this case, it's going to be the position of this cursor on the computer screen, okay? So now when he thinks about moving, he moves this cursor around on the screen, and he can check his email, or he can drive his wheelchair around, um, and now he's more independent than he was before. Does that make sense? So this is how they do brain control, right? Wouldn't it be good if you could connect this to this? Yeah, that's one of the things that people are working on, too. Do you have any questions about that? Okay. I have to go over to YouTube. So I'm going to show you first, this is a retinal implant. So um, those electrodes that are on the back of the eye, this is for somebody who is completely blind. Um, he's late blind, which means he wasn't blind from birth. He had a degenerative disease. Yeah, do, do you have a question? Or are you just um, adjusting? Oh, okay. He had a degenerative disease that caused him to be blind <coughs> later in life. Okay. And they've given him one of these implants, and this is a test of the implant to see how well he can see with it. So something on the left. I mean, there's 
you have something round or no lamp. I only see two objects. Mm -hmm. Uh, only two, there are only two. Okay, and so it's round on the left, you know, and then the one on the right looks like it's, it's longer and it's curving like a little bit like this one. Okay, well, it must be a banana. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to look very It's round.
what do I, I keep talking about these signals and signal processing. I just want to tell you a little bit about the math that goes into this, just to give you sort of an idea of the engineering part of this. So a signal is just anything that you can measure over space and time. And in this case, we're talking about um, electrical signals, right? So all of the electrical activity of the brain. And we're going to look at this signal both in time and also in frequency, which is something that you guys will probably learn about in high school or maybe in college, okay? And then the objective for the brain-computer interface is to find the features of the signal, the things about that signal that correspond to the behavior that we want, right? So like I was talking about earlier, you want to find the part of the brain that responds when you want to do some motor action, when you want to walk or when you want to talk or when you want to move your arm, right? So what we want to do is analyze the signal and figure out what part of that signal, decode it, figure out how the electricity is, um, what the electricity means for the behavior that we're interested in, okay? So then we get our subjects to control an external device. For the most part, the external de device that we're talking about is a computer person on a screen, like I was talking about before. This is a game that we commonly have them play. It's called Brain Pong. And you guys are all too young to remember the original Pong, but it was like the first video game ever. And it was kind of boring because all you did was uh, bounce a ball around on a paddle like ping pong, but on a computer. So it's not the most exciting game, but it turns out to be kind of exciting if you're playing it with your brain, right? But while that's fun, it might not be uh, very functional. It might, it would be exciting if you could play ping pong with your brain, but it might not be worth having the brain surgery for, right? Uh, on the other hand, what if we could get people to control an external device like this, which is a really uh, fancy robotic arm that was also here at the University of Washington. So, I'm going to show you a demo of somebody doing that. You're going to see in this video, so what we have is a person who's at the hospital with those implants in their brain. You can kind of see their head right here. It's all wrapped up in a bandage because they've just had brain surgery, okay? And then this robotic arm is actually not in the room. It's not in the hospital room. And that's just because of a lot of different kinds of regulations about what you can take into the hospital. Instead, the arm is at the computer science building here on the campus at the University of Washington. And they have connected um, this guy's brain to this arm remotely over Skype. So he's having a very interesting teleconference call where he's going to be controlling this robotic arm using his brain. And what you're going to hear is a graduate student is giving him instructions about what to do. And hopefully what you'll see is what the robotic arm does in response to his brain activity. Pinch and relax and pinch and relax. Try it again. So now instead of him telling him, grab him onto a visual cue ball. Got it. Okay. Questions about that? So I just want to say one more thing. So I've been talking about sensory BCI and motor BCI. They're these two really separate things, and you would only build one at a time. But what we're really interested in here at the center is, is closing that loop, right? And your brain does this naturally. You get uh, visual sensation, you get auditory sensation, and you feel tactile sensation. Um, and your brain incorporates those all very easily into your next motor action. And what we'd like to be able to do here at the center is build a device that does that really well also. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's the end of my presentation. 